Hi, I'm Hilary Victoria and welcome back to my crime and policing channel. In today's video, we are going back into the deepest, darkest pits of humanity. We are going to look at two of the worst serial killers I think, morally, I've ever read about or heard about or studied. And that's a lot of people. I'm not like a weird, I do it for a job, so there you go. Yeah, I'm talking about Burke and Hare. So, born in Ireland and their crimes were in Scotland, in Edinburgh, one of my favourite cities. Yeah, so Burke and Hare were prolific in the 1820s. So, 1827, 1828 and a little bit after that. So, they were prolific. They killed 16 people that we know of, maybe even more. And what I'd like to do is discuss that. However, prior to this, something else happened that paved the way for people to be able to commit these types of crimes. And this is the bloody code. So we're going back hundreds and hundreds of years. So when crimes and things happen, there's generally stuff that happens before that leads to these types of crimes to be able to be committed. Now, criminals are very clever. I say this sometimes, I know we get some really dumb ones, don't get me wrong. I've shared like a little stupid criminals video before, but some criminals are quite clever, quite canny, and they know what to do to get what they want. Now, what a lot of people want when they commit crimes is higher income, funding, right? They want some money. Maybe there's a bit of strain theory going on. I don't know, let's chuck a couple of crime theories in. Why not? So, anyway, something that happened that made this kind of crime happen was the reduction of corpses that were taken into scientific buildings in the 1800s for people to dissect when they're studying anatomy and things like that. So, the bloody code will go there first. That's where it kind of initiated. So, some period of time between the 17th century and the 19th century, there were massive amounts of crimes, right, that were sentenced by the death penalty. So capital punishment in the UK. We don't have that now here. Uh, I know some countries still do, we don't. And yeah, there were 200 crimes, about 200 crimes that were punishable by the death penalty. So let's have a think about what kind of crimes you might get a death penalty for. There's 200, there's quite a lot of crimes, right? Murder, right, obviously. That's the big one, isn't it? Murder. And uh, what else? Maybe rape, serious sexual offences, kidnap. You know the big ones, the big indictable offences. What about um, disturbing the garden well? That's a good one. Chopping down a tree? Yep, yeah, I love that one. What else could we do? Hmm. Interfere with cattle? All these crimes that now would be kind of trivial and easily remedied in a different way, a different type of punishment you were sentenced to death for. So bear in mind there are 200, right? Have a think about how many crimes you know, right? 200 sentenced to death. That's crazy, isn't it? Thinking that even in most countries where we still have capital punishment, they're not the kind of crimes you're gonna get killed for, right? So, yes, there you go, it was massive. So it's a period of time known as the bloody code. However, somebody we're all fond of and familiar with changed all that. So, we know Sir Robert Peel, right? Come on, the granddaddy of policing. He created the modern day policing in 1829. I know I say modern day policing, but in the grand scheme of things, right, that's kind of modern. Anyway, so he created this policing thing as we know in 1829. However, before that, he created something else, the Jails Act 1823. And within that, he also kind of changed how many of these crimes were punishable by death. In fact, what he did was get rid of 130 of those. He's like, guys, come on. We can't put someone to death for that. Come on now. Now, in this time, this bloody code time, like I mentioned, so the 17th century, the 19th century, science was huge. It's called the Age of Enlightenment for a reason, right? So criminal minds or criminologists, criminologists, there you go, got it out. And medicine was really on the up. Gone were the days where you're just shoving leeches here, there and everywhere and hoping for a remedy or just getting all the blood out of people. Yeah, that bad bit of blood's gonna come out and then you'll be fine. <laughs> you'll be fine. Yeah, so medicine was on the up. Criminology was on the up. Science everywhere was on the up. The age of enlightenment was amazing. We were learning so much stuff, developing everything. However, so medicine is great. We know this. Um, I've got big respect for anybody who works in medicine. Um, I couldn't do it. You're all way cleverer than me. However, in order to discover stuff, they had to have a look at things, to examine things, to maybe dissect some stuff. And the stuff they were dissecting were people. So when we're looking at like anatomy and things like that, and we're looking at 
you know, how things work and maybe how to cure a disease or why this thing has done this. What they would do is chop it open and have a look. Hmm, okay. We'll learn about anatomy. I mean, still now, if you are learning anatomy and stuff, you will have people whose bodies are donated to science, etc. You'll still look at dead bodies now. You'll still do it. I've got a friend who did it and she was like, oh, she's so grim. But she loved it and, you know, she's a very clever scientist. So, yes, this, you'll still do that if that's the kind of thing you want to do. However, you won't do it by uh, robbing a grave or by murdering someone, I hope. So what they would do then, in this period of time, this bloody code, the cadavers, the bodies that resulted from the um, capital punishment, would be donated to science. Like, you know, they could be, not all of them. Um, and what they would do then is look at the anatomy, look at all this kind of stuff, like I said, dissect and learn it all the time. And then Sir Robert Peel came in and spoiled all their fun. In fact, by the time that the people we're talking about were um, caught, there were only like five different types of crime that were still punishable by death. Now, this meant the research dried up. The scientists still wanted to know about bodies, right? We still want to know what makes things work. In fact, they still use it now, like I've said. So, there was a way to get that, right? Grave robbing, yay! So bad eggs like Burke and Hare would dig people up, take them to the science buildings, get some money, yay! In fact, it was so prevalent in the 1800s, people would have to start like boxing off the graves of their loved ones with um, cages, iron cages, and locking them close. People would be what on watch in cemeteries to stop people stealing bodies, because you get loads of money for it, like a lot. In fact, the first corpse that Burke and Hare sold to science, they got over seven pounds for, which now you're thinking, I can't even get a Starbucks for seven pounds. But then, it was about 850 quid, right? Just for a body, yay. And if you did it a lot, you'd be a rich, rich. And back in those days, lots of people died. They didn't yet have the advances in medicine. And people weren't all that fussy about, you know, regulating stuff like, where did you get that from? So yeah, here we go. We're going in to Burke and Hare. Now we know why it was a type of crime they wanted to do. We know that it's a financial gain, right? We know that potentially, if we're looking at rational choice theories, that the risk doesn't outweigh the reward because the reward outweighs the risk. People aren't going to miss some waves and strays. People aren't going to miss this person who's travelled up to Edinburgh. You don't have mobile phones anymore. You're not going to ping your GPS signal up any masks, are we? You're in Edinburgh. No one knows. You're mine. So, Burke and Hare, both born in Ireland, travelled over to Scotland. William Burke and William Hare, respectively. Both the same first name, as handy. So, let's start with William Burke. William Burke moved from uh, County Tyrone over to Scotland after he fell out with his wife. So, he was actually really, really like middle class before he went down the downward spiral that he went on. Born to a good middle class family, got a brother, um, they both ended up in the military and he married, he settled down with his wife and in County Mayo and he had a bit of a fallout with his father-in-law about land. So they had some beef, it all came to a head and he's like, I'm out of here, bye. And he just completely abandoned his family and moved to Scotland to go and work on this Union Canal. Off he goes, right, to go and work on that. And he met and fell in love with Helen McDougall. Now, she was affectionately known as Nelly, and they were kind of happy, I guess. They lived where they were, worked on the Union Canal. Then they moved to Edinburgh, to Tanner's Close. Now, I looked at Tanner's Close when I was in Edinburgh recently, and like, honestly, we looked everywhere for it, couldn't find it. It's just another excuse to go back to Edinburgh, right? If anybody watching this knows where it is, please put it in the comments so I can have a look when I go back. Because as you know, I'm a crime and history enthusiast and that is right up my street. Anyway, here we go. They've moved to Edinburgh now, live around Tanner's Close and they're hawkers. So they're selling like rags and stuff like that to other people of a low socioeconomic background and a bit of cash, you know, kind of happy, kind of well known in the community and kind of well liked. So after that, Burke became a cobbler, fixing people's shoes and stuff and it was known as being quite a nice person, went to like the church things, even though like wasn't really of that religion, apparently according to some sources, he was Catholic and he went to like non-Catholic stuff, whatever, right? So he was kind of well known, everyone kind of knew who he was, fair enough. Then we get Hare, so William Hare, also from Ireland, moved over to Edinburgh to work on the Union Canal, well, Edinburgh, sorry, moved over to Scotland to work on the Union Canal. Ooh, friends, okay. Then he moves to Edinburgh in the 1820s as well, because he's heard it's kind of a nice place. And he starts lodging in a place in Tanner's Close, 
Ooh, wow. <laughs> so this lodging house then is where he meets a guy called Logue and his wife, Margaret Laird. Now Logue dies. Oh no, poor Margaret. Her moves in. So he didn't wear anything about it, did he? Straight in with Margaret. And these guys become a couple. Now, the um, sources on the internet aren't very nice about these people in terms of their appearance. So they describe hair as being like kind of ratty and like, um, it's weird. Do you know you just like kind of think of like, like ratty, thin, a bit scruffy, not very much going on, cuts and stuff all over his face. Apparently it was, uh, what was the word now? What's the word for it? Illiterate and uncouth. That's how it was described. Lovely. And his lady friend Margaret was not described any nicer. In fact, they said that she was kind of like sturdy looking and a bit like, kind of like, looks a bit like a dude. So they weren't very nice about either of them, that they wouldn't be because of the crimes they committed. So remember with everything in media and writing and stuff, things on that time are based on how things, you know, people feel about stuff. Similar to what it's like now, right? Anyway, so this is Birkin here, there you go. He's living in this um, lodging house. They're both living on Tanner's Close. They're both in these nice little um, unions, whether or not they're married or, I don't know, not. There they are, Edinburgh. Cool. Now, Hare and his wife are in this lodging house. Hare's friends with Burke, right? One of the customers just like drops dead of something called dropsy, which I had to Google, which means it's like fluid retention and stuff. Anyway, he dies of dropsy and Hare's like sounding off to Burke and he's really annoyed. He's like, I cannot believe this guy, right? He owes me four pounds, four whole English pounds. And Hare's like, I need this, the four pounds a lot of money, right? That's what, 200 quid or something now? So he's anyway, he's really annoyed. He's sounding off to Burke and Burke's like, I have got an idea for you. And Hare's like, all right, but what is this idea? And he's like, why don't we sell him? Hare's like, to who? Who wants a dead body, Burke? Oh, and they sell him to science, right? They're like, well, I'm definitely gonna sell this guy. Yeah, that'll get our money back. So they do. So the guy comes over, makes a coffee for him, a cop and a guy, whatever, you know people. Um, they're like, oh yeah, thank you, yeah, cheers. Pick him up tomorrow, cool, thanks. He's gone, they pop it open, get him out, fill it with bark and leaves and stuff, nail it back together, shove him under a bed, jobs are good at. And then, the day after, they come and take his coffee, yeah, feels about right, off it goes to be buried. Now, Burke and Hare have got this dead guy under the bed. Got a dead guy, what? And they decide to take it to university to sell to one of these doctors who pay out for cadavers. Now, they find him, off they go to the doctors, the um, Edinburgh University, because it's massive, right? Edinburgh University is renowned for being a brilliant university, now and back then. They're like one of the leading anatomy ones, so there you go, that's what it was in the time. So, off they go, taking his body with them. And they find someone there, it's like a student guy, like, oh, we're looking for Dr. Somebody. And they're like, oh, who you need is Peter Knox. And they're like, okay. So off they go to find Peter Knox. And he pays him, pays him well. He pays him over seven pounds for that body, which is worth about 850 quid in today's money. Cha-ching, thank you very much. So that'll pay off the back rent. So they get the money, off they go. Yes, that was awesome, brill. And this is in November of 1827, right? And on the way out, this student guy's like, oh, Knox said, if you ever need to get rid of any more, where are you guys? They're like, right? And off they go anyway. So off they go with the money thinking, excellent, that's made a terrible situation so much better. Got rid of the dead guy and I got some money. Cool. So by about January, February, the money starts to run out, right? And they're like, do you know what we need to do? To find another body. Oh, do they? In fact, they don't find anybody else. They don't find the body. They make some. So what they do over a period of time is they murder 16 people. Wow. And the MO, their mode is operating, is kind of the same the whole way through. What they do is they suffocate people. Well, they get them drunk on whiskey. Come on in, let's have a whiskey together. Ooh. They get drunk. They have a whale of a time. This person passes out. Suffocation, dead. Off they go for sale. Thank you very much. Now, they worked out that if they suffocated people, they didn't leave marks on the bodies, so they sold for more money. If you take someone there, they're like butchered, they're like, what are you done with that? I can't use that for anatomy. If you take someone who was just, they were just really drunk, fell asleep and choked on, you know, whatever, they're like, all right, yeah, cool, thanks. Here's a tenner. So the second person they took up, the one they killed, the first one they killed, they got £10 for. 
10 pounds is over a grand in back in those days. A grand is like over a thousand pounds in England. Well, a grand is a thousand pounds in England. Anyway, they got over a grand for this dead body. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Well, they were. They decided that that one body just wasn't enough. And like I said, over the period of time, they killed 16. Now, their lady wives, uh, Nelly and Margaret, claimed they didn't really know what was going on, but they did. They really did. And they would like lock the doors where the people were with the subjects, post the key back under so they could do whatever they needed to do. Margaret and Nell like, oh, should we go out for a pint while this is happening? They're like, yeah, maybe we should. Anyway, it went on until it didn't. And that is because they got sloppy. They always get sloppy, don't they? They always, always, always drop the ball. And it started with the murder of daft Jamie Wilson. Now, I hate saying that about someone. That was his nickname given by, not by me, by other people. And that's because at the time he was referred to as daft Jamie because he had like a lower mental capacity than his age would suggest generally. He got some medical conditions, some mental health conditions. Um, he was, uh, yeah, he was homeless. He made his way through life by begging on the streets and, you know, people looking after him in a charitable way. So they murdered him the same way. They lured him in with whiskey. And um, although he wasn't like a big drinker, apparently he preferred snuff. Um, they tried to get him drunk on whiskey. He put up a bit of a fire, bless him. And uh, they killed him, obviously, in the same way they always do. But when they took his body up, some of the students recognised him. They were like, isn't that this kid who hangs around town? They're like, this, that's a better boy, right? And they're like, oh no, it just looks really well like him. It's not him. No, oh sugar. It was, obviously. They're getting sloppy now. It happens every time. Then they got even sloppier. Their last murder was Margaret Doggerty. Now, they lured Margaret back to the Brogan lodging house, which was nearby to Hare's lodging house. Now, this is where Burke was staying. And they lured her in the pretense that maybe they were related, because she was also Irish, middle-aged Irish woman. And they were like, we could be related. My mum's a doctor. Oh my God, we could be related. Come on, let's, let's have a let's get the crack on, let's go. So they went to the lodging house. They are drinking whiskey, you know, how the story goes. However, two people were staying there, the Greys. They're like, hmm, we've got these two people staying here. This is going to blow our cover. Let's just kill all three. But oh, that's a lot of work, isn't it? Three dead people. Let's get rid of them. Hey guys, why don't you go stay at Hare's house, right? It's a lodging house, it's beautiful, just down the street. Um, we're having a party here tonight, an old family friend. Yeah, you know what it's like. We don't want to keep you up with all our noise and stuff. And they were like, yeah, okay, whatever, the greys. They go and stay at Hare's lodging house. They come back at nine o'clock that night, right? Party's in full swing. They're all singing, dancing, being hammered, just having a whale of a time. Yeah, there you go, having a great time. So the greys are like, God, it's rowdy in here, and off they go. They come back the next morning and um, they're like, oh, I, I need to get back into our room. I've left some stuff there. And they're like, oh, you can't go in there. Oh, yeah. We've got to air it out, you know, some other lame excuse. They wouldn't let them back in. And they're like, this is really sus. Anyway, they go back later in the day and they find their room and they're like, there's something really weird about this. So they start looking around the room thinking, you know, they've been rummaging through our stuff. Like, what, what's going on? On their search, they found a dead body. Just what you want when you're on your holidays, right? Under the bed, they find Margaret Doherty. Very dead. So covered in blood and spit and stuff like that, as you do. And they're like, this is terrible. Off they go to find a police constable. And they're off looking for a policeman. And then um, Margaret and Nellie are like, oh no, don't do that. Margaret offers to pay him like loads of money not to squeal. But they're like, absolutely not. That is gross and disgusting. We're going to the police. Off they go to find the police. In the meantime, they're getting rid of that body. They're like, we've got to get this out now. However, you're not quick enough, are you? Yes, the body's gone. When the police arrived, they're like, there's no body in here. What are you on about? And they're like, I promise you, there's definitely a body under that bed. So they continue their search and they find bloodied clothes. I wish to try and pass off for some other lame excuse. The police are not buying it. And they head off to the university with their suspicions intact. When they get there on arrival, they ask to see the cadavers that Knox has got. Guess who they find? They find Margaret Doherty, very dead. In the same state that the Greys said they saw her. 
oh dear. And they positively identified and said, yep, she was the one dancing last night with these people. They killed her. Wow. They got arrested. Yes, they did. Now, they were arrested along with their wives. Brogan had apparently got away with it, nothing to do with it. Burke, Hare, Nellie, Margaret, they got locked up. They also interviewed, obviously, in question, Knox. Now, Knox is like, they did what? What? I know I bought these bodies, right? I didn't know they murdered them. He claimed, I'm not sure if this is true or not, he claimed, he thought, because these guys um, ran poor lodging houses, they just sold them bodies that nobody collected for burial. He th thought that's what was happening, apparently. So the family didn't break any laws, and off he goes. <laughs> Thank you for the bodies. Burke and Hare, not so lucky. So, out of all of these characters in our story, only one received the gallows, and that was Burke. Hare and his wife, they testified against Burke in court. Knox and his associates said, yep, yeah, these guys provided us with bodies all the time, thinking that they weren't illegally gained. Burke's wife was also on the stands as well. She was all right to go, um, got mobbed, right? And the police took her into the police station for her own protection. She climbed out the window and escaped because that came under siege. Um, and she escaped Edinburgh the next day. Off she goes into the sunset. Don't know where she's gone now. Hare and his wife, they were exonerated because they squealed on Burke. They said, yeah, he did it all. Pinned it all on him. Yeah, we're involved in moving the bodies. We're just little people trying to make a bit of money. Um, they were allowed to go. What? What in the justice system is this? Them, them two are allowed to go. Off they go. No one's ever heard of Hare since, by the way. So I'll go through some fun facts in a minute from the University of Edinburgh. However, Burke is not so lucky. He also said, by the way, in one of his statements, Knox had no idea these bodies were ill-gotten gains. He had no idea that they'd murdered him to supply to him. So he was kind of nice in that way that he let him go. Not nice in the fact he murdered 60 people. Anyway, so he gets the gallows, obviously. And there he is, he's died. People paid money, right, to watch him be hanged. I mean, back in the olden days when public executions were a thing, it was like a proper crowd pleaser. They have people selling things, oh, come, sausage roll. They have all sorts of things going on while this execution was on. It was like a proper family fun day out. Anyway, so, yeah, that's what happened. Burke was killed. Now, I have got five fun facts from the University of Edinburgh. So, fact number one, Burke's body was dissected. How is that for justice? What goes around comes around, Burke. So, Burke's body was dissected and his skin was used to make a notebook. What in the Jeffrey Dahmer is that? They made a notebook. Oh, do you know what I need? I need a new notebook. Got any paper? I haven't. However, I just pull out this skin. Yeah, so they made a notebook out of Burke's dissected body skin. Lovely. Number two, Hare shot and killed his own horse. Don't get in the way for that. He shot and killed his own horse because he was mad at it. That's the kind of person we're dealing with here. So because his horse wouldn't pull this heavy load of dead bodies for him up to the university, shot it and killed it. Nice guy. Okay, number three. No one knows what happened to her. And I mentioned that earlier. No one actually knows where he went. So after they were like, yep, you can go. Thanks for telling us of all your mate's fault. He's going to die now. You've got to leave. Um, off he goes. No one's ever seen him. People think he went to Dumfries. People say he might have gone back to Ireland. No one really knows. But anyway, he got away with it. Like I said, people pay good money for these seats. That's fact number four from the University of Edinburgh's website. So um, obviously you could just go and have a look at an execution. But it was that packed, crowded. It says 2,500 people went to see this guy get killed, right? To see the um, hanging. So there they go to the execution place and you can still see it now. If you go to Edinburgh and look on the floor, you can see like the shadow of the gallows, which is in like a slightly different colour brick. It's pretty awesome. So yeah, off they go to have a look at that. And the houses on either side, uh, the buildings on either side, would charge people money to look out the window so they'd get like a bird's eye view of it. Number five, a new word was coined after. So burking somebody meant to suffocate them because that's obviously the MO on how they killed them. And as with all things weird and, you know, Victorian, the kids at the time made a little rhyme. They do it all the time. There you go. Here we go. I'm going to read it to you now. Try not to be amazed by my acting. Up the close and down the stairs, but and Ben with Burke and Hare. Burke's a butcher, Hare's a thief, knocks the boy that buys the beef. Gross. Call the dead guy beef. Come on. Anyway, that is a story of Burke and Hare. I hope you found that interesting. I appreciate it's slightly different to my usual like lore and stuff. This is how this channel started by creating these types of videos. 
because I am mad into history and obviously crime. That's why I do it for a job. And yeah, it's one of my more interesting cases. Thank you for watching. Look after yourselves, look after each other, and please don't commit any crimes.